Welcome back to another episode of The Art of Photography. My name is Ted Forbes. Today we are going to do a little show and tell. Uh, I'm still getting situated in my new studio here and I was actually moving some stuff yesterday and in some boxes I found some remnants of my uh, really crappy camera collection and I thought this would make a fun podcast to kind of show you some of these things. Uh, just to give you a little premise for you know when I started collecting these and why. Um, this was probably about, oh gosh, 10 years ago or so. Uh, maybe a little longer, when digital cameras became cheap enough, professional photographers were all going digital, so to speak. And I really loved shooting. Uh, I had a Canon Digital Rebel, it was my first uh, digital camera. And, you know, my experience with, with shooting digital format all of a sudden, I mean, it was brilliant. I mean, the clarity and the sharpness, and, you know, it was, it was just really a new thing uh, for a lot of people. And one of the things, though, that uh, my work at the time that I was doing, and probably it still holds true today, even though I shoot both, um, is that I was really looking for a grit, and I wanted to get away from a lot of that sterile, superb cleanness. And so in this weird kind of fit of uh, ambition, I went back and, and not only wanted to shoot film, but I wanted to find the crappiest film cameras I could possibly get a hold of. And a lot of these are going to be um, very similar in nature to the Holga. And if you watch the podcast, you know about Holgas and Holga projects and all that stuff that we've got going on. And these are very similar in the way they function. Um, this first camera that I'm going to show you, this is a uh, this is what's known as a box camera. And uh, Kodak, about the time that they started making uh, taking pictures, they were you know putting it in the hands of the public and then mass producing film and cameras. And all of a sudden, you had uh, places where you could go get your film developed. Uh, you know, Kodak had the slogan: "You take the picture, we do the rest." And you could actually send either a camera or the film off, and they would process it and develop it. And this was probably oh, this is an, actually not a Kodak camera. This is an Ansco Cadet. It's an Ansco Cadet B2 is the model. And it is uh, as crude as it gets. Um, basically what the deal is, is you load it with 120 medium format film, which is still plentifully available. And let me show you how to do this. You basically have this cartridge in here and you roll your film on that. It comes over the front and it's made out of a fine cardboard. Uh, these were produced, uh, I want to say probably the 1930s. So it's pretty old. Uh, and I'll get in that in a minute. Anyway, once you got your film on, you basically slide that back into the camera. Uh, lock it in place with the uh, with the winder. And there is a note in here that tells you, for best results, use ANSCO film. And of course, they all had that because the manufacturers made the cameras and the film. But anyway, cardboard camera, you close that up. And the control, <laughs> I was going to say controls. There's two controls on here. Basically, you can wind the film when you're ready to go to the next frame. And there's a red window on the back. Uh, use the, the number that's on the paper to, uh, to determine what, what shot you're on, just like the Holga. Uh, and the only control on here is the shutter. And this camera is so old, it's a simple spring-operated shutter in here. And when I got it, uh, you know, you had to be ready to experiment a little bit because uh, you'll take it outside and you have no idea what the exact shutter speed is, even if they had one printed on here. It's, this, like I said, the spring is getting old. Uh, it, it's pretty slow. Um, and the aperture I've determined to be around somewhere between f11 and maybe f16, uh, more like f11. So. Anyway, uh, but that's kind of the fun of this is is being able to go out and blow a couple rolls and take notes and you eventually determine the ISO and you learn what the shutter speed is and what the aperture is approximately. And uh, it, you can get some really cool results. Believe it or not, even though it's a very simple meniscus lens, this camera has actually taken some pretty sharp pictures if you can get your exposure right. And it's a lot of fun to shoot on. Uh, it's very crude. The viewfinders are just simple little mirrors with, with viewfinders. So you see these two. Uh, viewfinders on the front and if you look on the top there's basically like a 45 degree angle mirror that sits in here and these are caked over they're really even hard to use I don't even use them uh, when I'm shooting on this you just point in the direction and go and uh, hope that you're in the ballpark uh, but the reason I bought this camera actually this cost a whole five dollars I think on eBay is that I had an old um, photography manual that was written probably in the 40s or 50s and they were talking in there and they were saying, you know, and it's like I preach on this show today in the 21st century, uh, but they were saying in there, you know, it's not the camera, it's the photographer. And if you're a good photographer, you should be able to make really good sharp pictures uh, using an old box camera. And I remember reading that thinking, okay, in the 21st century, I'm going to take this challenge upon myself and I'm going to, to try to achieve the same. And it was kind of a fun experiment. But uh, the Ansco, these are easy to find uh, in varying conditions. Sometimes they're trash just because they're so old and so cheaply made. But uh, they can be a lot of fun uh, and very inexpensive. Uh, I'll go through and show you a couple other cameras that I've got here. This is kind of a fun one. Again, same premise as the Holga. This is called 
an empire baby and you can find these i think they were produced in england i want to say uh don't quote me on any of these this is this is totally guessing uh and i don't know what year but uh, judging by mine came with the original box and it looks like something was probably done in the 50s or maybe the 60s so around there uh, this takes 127 film okay and we're going to get into our film primer pretty soon uh coming up on february 3rd so i'll make sure i'll make an announcement on that but uh anyway uh, the empire baby is very very cool um it uses 127 film which is somewhere in size between 120 film which is medium format it's smaller than that but it's not quite as small as 35 millimeter and again a completely weird plastic lens no two are alike um, and you can get some really cool results with these cameras with some funky blurs and stuff and I'm not sure that the film actually sits flat when it's in the camera which adds to the fun even more uh, this one has an annoying neck strap that's attached to it that probably should be cut off but um, whatever uh, anyway I've had a lot of fun using this again winder and then the clown nose the big red shutter button. That's how you take the picture. And it couldn't be more crude. Uh, it's, it is odd though, because the way the 127 film works in here is that by default, it, it shoots portrait orientation. So if you want to shoot a landscape or a longer side, you actually have to hold it. It's the opposite of what you would do on a standard camera. Uh, but anyway, a lot of fun and goofy and I've gotten some great results over the years. In fact, I'd like to shoot on this. You can get 127 film still. You have just about no options. I think there's one or two kinds. Uh, EFCA makes a 127 uh, cut film still and uh, there may be somebody else. But uh, if you go to, I'll put links in the show notes. So once again, as usual, theartofphotography.tv, you can see them there. Um, but you can get them through like Freestyle Photo, maybe b &H. There's places where you can find 127 film if you look around. So anyway, a uh, big pain to find film for. Oh, and also scanning and developing are interesting too, because unless you have tanks that are the right size or even film holders on your scanner that are the right size, I had to make them. And uh, I didn't make the, I had a tank that worked, but I had to make a, a holder for my scanner, and that was kind of fun. I just made it out of cardboard. Uh, and the film likes to curl, so it's, it's a big pain. Uh, but worth it, I think. Um, you can get some interesting images. Uh, let me go ahead and show you this one too. This is, uh, again, very Holgeish. These were probably built in the 40s or 50s. This is the very Art Deco classy Spartus full view. And the Spartus full view, again, uh, it's like a Holga. Um, it's just basically, this one does have a bulb, so if you, it doesn't have a tripod socket, but if you wanted to shoot at night, um, you could if you had it attached to some kind of platform. Uh, what's interesting about this is it's a twin lens configuration here. And uh, you know you know the term DSLR because it's very common today and it stands for digital single lens reflex camera. And this was actually a twin lens reflex camera. And the way it worked is you had the taking lens, which is the bottom one. This is the lens that actually will project the image onto the film. And then you had the viewing lens, which is in the top. And the viewing lens, again, much like the box camera, has a 45 degree angle mirror here, which mine actually was detached when I first bought this and had to glue it back in. And then you lift it up and there's your viewfinder. And you're probably not gonna see much in here because the ceiling is fairly dark. Uh, but anyway, very fun to shoot on. Um, and what's interesting, these older cameras um, is trying to find ways to kind of hack them into doing things that you want them to do. Uh, they're kind of designed for just outdoor picture taking of distance of some kind because they all have fixed focal, um, yeah, they have fixed focus. So you, they're kind of fixed at infinity with a with a shallow or a tight f-stop on them. So they're going to kind of keep most things in focus. But you can't do macro shots. You can't get too close or it does get blurry. Um, I'll put a link to this in the show notes too. But um, one of my friends, Gayla Trail, who's a Canadian photographer who's extremely good, uh, she went through a period where she was shooting a lot on box cameras and did a whole blog post on how, and I hope it's still up, but on how you can use a magnifying glass. And she figured out what the focal distance was and all. If you know the exact distance, you actually can't do macros on something like a box camera so things like that can be pretty fun too and and that's kind of half the joy of it and what i think is kind of the learning experience and where you get better as a photographer is trying to find ways to make equipment with very limited functions work for you and so anyway spartus full view another five dollar wonder and uh some very cool stuff these all have single element meniscus lenses and they're they're very much on the uh, crappy side of things uh moving up a little bit and I, literally there's no method to my madness here i just grabbed five random cameras but um these are things that I used to shoot on, really enjoy. And this one's actually broken right now, but uh, I would love to get another one one day. This is a, this is in more into the 15 to $20 range, so we're really moving up. Uh, but this is a Cereflex, and I can't remember what model this one actually is, uh, but uh, it's a Model D, it says on the side. And I think they had 
models A through F. And I honestly don't know what the differences are. I know that the F model is, go is a little more expensive because it has a nicer lens in it. But even this one is good enough. And this actually has shutter speeds that you can control on here. Uh, this was not a great design and my shutter speeds are actually off, especially if you're shooting anything above 50th of a second, you're fine. Uh, bulb exposures work fine. But when you get down to the 25th of a second and a 10th of a second, it likes to give you random times. Sometimes it's two seconds. Sometimes it's a 10th of a second, you know. It depends. Uh, so anyway, again, because of the age of these, these came out in the 50s, I want to say, probably the 40s or 50s, because uh, at the time, and this is a real camera, you, you have shutter speeds and you have aperture control. So anything from uh, f3.5 down to f22, and you have uh, focus on here, mine doesn't work, but you do. Uh, and this is a twin lens reflex. So once again, you pull the top up and uh, you're able to look through there and focus, uh, taking lens and viewing lens on the front. Um, the the kind of some of the the history behind this camera is the the camera at the time that was very popular was the Roloflex that you've probably seen which is the same design and Roloflexes were made in Germany and obviously in World War II uh, finding these outside of Germany uh, they became very rare and so there were several other companies that stepped up at the time and there were two American companies that stepped up to make cameras and neither one of them I mean these are kind of tanks and they're very heavy uh, they couldn't compete price wise and Roloflex lasted and these did not uh, they weren't able to the challenge. Uh, the Ansco made a, um, a, um, a twin lens reflex and then also Seraflex, which was later bought by Graflex. So if you're into your camera history, that's where these came from. Uh, but anyway, this starts getting into a notch above a Holga. You know, you're able to do a little more with it. Um, and I've done funky things like this, like actually loaded up with 35 millimeter film and you can shoot over the sprocket holes and stuff. Um, it takes 120 film, easy to find and very cool. Uh, so anyway, so that's moving up just a little bit. Uh, and then finally, I wanna show you one last camera that again is quite a bargain. Uh, that is actually a really nice camera, I feel. Uh, this is a Kodak Retina 3C, and there are varying models of these. Uh, there was Retina 1s, Retina 2s, then later on there was a single lens reflex. Uh, but this is actually a rangefinder camera, and Kodak uh, makes wonderful film and is very much known for that. Uh, they are not so much known for their cameras. The they had box cameras and then a whole slew of stuff that was just awful uh, through the years, uh, probably even today. Uh, but anyway, uh, as I mentioned though the reflex, or the, excuse me, the Retina. I think is the the exception to that. This had an extremely sharp lens in it. Um, the downside is is uh, it's completely. 100% uncomfortable to use. It has the little genie lens. So basically it's a folder camera. So the idea is that it would fit in your pocket, but uh, I don't know who has pockets that are that big. Maybe back in the 40s and 50s they, they did. Uh, but anyway, you basically pop that up to release it. And the way a rangefinder works is you have your viewing lens up here, it's a little bit of the twin concept. And then you focus, it's got a second um, lens that basically just li lets light in. If you've never used a rangefinder, this works like a Leica or something like that, where you, you have your frame lines around the, uh, around the viewing um, uh, area there and then in the middle there's a little diamond and you see a second image that's just kind of lit a slightly different color and then when you move the focus you see that move and so what you want to do is basically line up your images and that's how you focus on these things they're very weird but 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 very cool. Um, on a well ergonomically designed camera, it's actually very fast to focus like that. Um, not so much on this one. Uh, this is a slow camera, but uh, this is still one of my favorites. It's got a Schneider Krishnak lens in it, and uh, it, this is a fixed 50 millimeter length. Uh, it actually, the f-stop, the widest is 2.0. And uh, they also made attachments. So literally you would take the center element out and you could buy attachments. They had a portrait and I believe a wide angle and maybe even a telephoto. Uh, so there may have been four different uh, lens links. I just have the one. Uh, but folks, this takes some of the sharpest images I've ever taken and it's a 35 millimeter camera. Uh, they're way sharper than anything I've ever done with my Nikon cameras or my Canon cameras uh, that are 35 millimeter. They were designed later. Uh, but there was just such a magic that, that came with a lot of this German engineering around this time. And, you know, I'd, I'd love to do a whole show on it sometime, but I mean, there really was kind of a golden age of lens design, lens design uh, that was, you know, really started in the late 30s and went up through the 50s. And the stuff coming out of Germany with Schneider and Carl Zeiss and and, uh, you know, uh, the coatings weren't perfected like they are today, but my God, the lenses are so sharp and they still hold up. Uh, if you're shooting black and white or even if you're shooting color and you don't mind doing color correction, uh, just some amazing sharpness, some amazing detail. It's 35 millimeter, but uh, I mean, sometimes this is sharper than, than images I get on a 120, uh, depending on the camera. Uh, but anyway, amazing stuff. 
Uh, but anyway, just a little bit of show and tell today on some strange, quirky cameras. I've wanted to do an episode like this for a long time, and I've never done it. And uh, today I was moving some boxes and decided, you know, now is the time to do this. So uh, again, I, I have more stuff. I just pulled out some of my favorites, but uh, just a, a little quirkiness to break up the regularly scheduled philosophy slash technique how-tos. But uh, anyway, so uh, just a reminder, um, we do have the film uh, episode coming up very soon for Masterclass Live. I'm going to start that on February 3rd. And uh, if you are not able to see it, uh, follow me on Twitter if you want to know when that's going to be. Uh, I'm probably going to change the time up this time to uh, uh, cater to some other people uh, in other countries that weren't able to participate last time, but we'll see. Um, follow me on Twitter. Um, Ted Forbes is my handle on Twitter. And, uh, you know, obviously we'll announce it in the show too. So when I get more finite defined on that, I will list it. So anyway, once again, this has been The Art of Photography, and thank you for watching.